All right. Well, welcome to Late Night with Lovecraft Easy. And today's, whoa, it's March the 1st, 2014. And got Pete Rollick here, and Rick, and Shane Ivey. Uh, we're going to talk to Shane Ivey about Delta Green stuff. We're going to talk about uh, Our Lady of Darkness. Rick wants to talk some about True Detective. We're going to talk about World, World, it's midnight, World War Cthulhu. And whatever else we feel like talking about. Whatever else you guys feel like talking about. Uh, so Shane, okay, uh, for the three people in the Lovecraft community who have not heard of Delta Green, can you kind of start from scratch and tell us what Delta Green is? Yeah, um, so uh, Delta Green is it's, it's fiction and um, games that are set in a modern day version of the Cthulhu mythos. So um, it started out actually as, uh, as as source books and source material for the role playing game Call of Cthulhu uh, right. way back when. And, um, <clears throat> and it got a lot of traction and people really really responded well to it. And so uh, so it branched off, branched out really quickly into uh, a couple of short story collections and a novel, and and then over the years we've had other other uh, other novels and sh stories and things. So, the, the right now we're in the middle of a Kickstarter for a new um, a new collection, which is our, which actually is through stretch goals generated enough for a, another a new anthology to uh, to go along with it that we'll be developing in the next couple of months. And there's a new. Um, Standalone RPG that we're doing as well, <clears throat> but it's modern day, and um, because it came from the role-playing game, the it, it was sort of it was built around um, around giving the player characters, the investigators, a context in which to go around poking into horrifying things that would make more sense than just. Um, you know, you're a private investigator, and you inherited another mansion from your dead uncle who was in. So, if it really happened in the real world, what, how would it work, kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, and so the so the approach is is um, sometimes uh, it's it sort of it skews slightly less pulpy um, than 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 some things. Uh, sometimes not. I mean, the the uh, there's a whole sort of um, Angle of the uh, of the Delta Green universe that's um, you know that 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 gets that gets pretty damn pulpy from time to time. But but the the kind of the point of it is is we're trying to kind of hew pretty closely to that Lovecraftian sense of um, you know of a uh, uh, a brutal universe that really doesn't have any need for humanity and. Uh, and in which our existence is fairly futile, and uh, and anyway, the whole universe is going to be dying of uh, of uh, of uh, heat death before you know it, anyway. So, what does it really matter? Um, and it's that kind of cheeriness that sort of drives Delta Green. And it looks like Scott yeah, Glantz sort of a, called yeah, sort of a too. Christmas Christmas uh, puppies kind of atmosphere. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's 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 very much all about. What what do we do in the face of cosmic terror? You know, and and about the the sort of existential threat that the universe poses to humanity. And it's all modern day scenarios, correct? Right, right, right. So the the um <clears throat> well it, the, the the fiction of it kind of span starts in uh, World War One and in in the the raid on Innsmouth especially, and then kind of picks up in in uh, in World War Two and the aftermath. So most of the things that we've done with it have been modern day, and the point of it that we're the point that we're that we're working from nowadays, of course, is um, it, it it actually makes a, a really great platform to explore modern issues, um, especially for American audiences, which is our main has been our main audience traditionally, of um, of the uh, sort of our place in the world and the nature of the war on terror and sort of what that implies about how we react to things that terrify and horrify us. 
and uh, but the but the but it it sort of spanned a lot of uh, a lot of the history of the 20th century. So the the short story collection that we're about to publish, <coughs> excuse me, Tales from Failed Anatomies, has stories all through the 20th century, starting in uh, just af just the the aftermath of Innsmouth and going up into um, up into the present day and and a little bit beyond. Yeah, so uh, the first thing we want to get out is if uh, if you don't know about Delta Green and you're a Lovecraft fan, you know you should. Uh, and secondly, uh, give them some support for this for this Kickstarter because this is a hell of a, a good looking collection and uh, might even work out to be two collections slash anthologies. Um, yeah, I, I think we're we're about thirty dollars away from officially pulling the trigger on on book two. So. Um, yeah. And with with more than a week to go, I'm pretty confident <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna get there. So it's it's really exciting. And book two, the the first book is all stories by um, Dennis Detwiller, who's one of the creators of Delta Green. And then the second book is an anthology that's gonna have a couple of stories by Dennis, and mm -hmm. stories by Scott and me and Robin Laws and Ken Height and and uh, and tons of other people. Some really really well established. Uh, um, Writers and a couple of, uh, of of people who are kind of uh, fairly new to the field as well. So it's going to be it's going to be really cool. Hey, bud, how's it going? Good to see you, Mr. Davis. How you doing, sir? Not too bad. Um, yeah, you know the the modern day scenario. I've seen we've talked about this before on the Lovecraft Easy and video chats, but uh you know i've seen some comments on various boards online where you know if it's if it doesn't happen in the 1920s in Innsmouth or blah 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 it's not lovecraftian and oh that's that's you, absolutely you know, that's absolutely correct because after all when lovecraft wrote he wrote in an in an antique period i mean he deliberately set oh, all yeah. this stuff in the 30 40 years before he was writing so yeah uh, and that's exactly the yeah. point that that he was writing in the modern era the era and what you know, it was it was the 30s and in the 20s that's not the modern era you know, clearly, he, this is meant to be an antique, uh, you know, period piece. And if you, you know, it's not meant to be a, I mean, the thought that it was that, that <clears throat> Lovecraft is, oh, I don't know, techno horror with the, uh, you know, with the uh, various uh, modern appliances and uh, modern uh, scientific methods being used to frighten his audience. Ah, that's, that's just ridiculous. I mean, obviously, you know, that, that's, that's the voice of heresy. Well, the short version is they don't know what they're talking about, but uh, the long version is, yeah, I mean, he wasn't... <laughs> yeah. I, I, one thing I think is interesting is, is, of course, Lovecraft deliberately wrote as he kind of developed this very deliberate persona of a man out of time, and he was in love with the past, and he, 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 he would love nothing better than to present himself as somebody who was an antique, and he kind of cultivated this language that was very old-fashioned, you know, yeah. and he sh he didn't show people things; he shooed them things, and uh, you know. But at the same time, his stories um, his stories were pulling things from the headlines and the science articles of the day, as you said. And so that and and that that does us all a huge favor because um, things like at the Mountains of Madness. Um, Kind of t uh, are a great cue to those of us today, all these decades later, that um, there's there's no shortage of um, sort of huge cosmically vertiginous horrors out there if we just want to sort of seize on them and be captivated by them the way that he was and the way yeah, that he no, kind he of really did admired really and his readers. He really did rip things from the headlines, as you said. I mean, uh, probably everyone here better than I has a better memory for these types of things. Uh, probably Rick especially. But, uh, you know, things like Pluto being discovered, um, you know, uh, that's one example. Mm -hmm. But, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, all of his stuff with, uh, you know, there, there were things about photography and, and the chemistry behind photography that... That um, <clears throat> that that he was interested in, and and like I said, the mountains of madness is just filled with. I mean, one of the things that makes that that no, uh, 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 novella 
novelette, novella, whatever, story, a challenge to read is that he made it so scientifically detailed, you know, and it's sort of filled with um, with all the sort of minutia of geology that um, <clears throat> that as you're reading it, I remember as a teenager when I was reading it, I got mm -hmm. really impatient reading that story because you know I want to get to the squiggly part and and the and the the shot well, and whatnot. That, that was the squiggly part. I mean, right, right, and, you know, and it's sort of. You know, it, it kind of dawned on me really gradually that he was using all of the mundane stuff to establish the world in which this was happening, and 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 therefore give it more kick when he actually got you to the things that were going to be terrifying. So well, he's he's yeah, he's building up your uh, your uh, uh, suspension of disbelief with as many you know genuine scientific <laughs> details yeah. as he could. Uh, I mean, we've all I, have we all already cited that article that somebody oh, it was Charles Strauss, the Charles Strauss article about how how much the universe expanded in Lovecraft's lifetime. Mm. Oh does, yeah. Does everybody, does everybody remember that article? Yeah, I remember it. Yeah. Where the uh, uh, theories of cosmology of uh, uh, in during his lifetime from the you know 18, late eighteen eighties forward. The universe got a couple of billion times bigger, um, just in his lifetime, and in the understanding of the speed of light, and understanding uh, the 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 idea of of you know how old the light you're looking at is um, uh, from these various yeah. star systems. Um, I've always enjoyed the fact that uh, yeah, his science. I mean, Lovecraft's uh, science is used to frighten his audience, and it's all very modern science. It's all very, you know, cutting edge, even if it is a layman's understanding of, of cutting edge science at the time. Um, but it is designed to frighten an audience that um, is utterly convinced of uh, a, you know, anthrocentric universe. Um, you know, we're a, we're a little less frightened, I think, of an anthropocentric of a universe that isn't centered around us, but granted that is only in the abstract. I mean, it's the difference between hearing about the total perspective vortex and being put into the total perspective. Yeah, well, let's talk about that for a minute, Scott, because well, you know, on one level, you're absolutely right um, about that time period. However, I, I'm wondering really how many people have that through their heads today. I mean, Zero. So many people, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so many people do not, you know. They How think many so. people think that the sun revolves around the Earth still? <laughs> oh, did, did we, did you, did we well, just... Well, they think that the universe horrifying. revolves around Earth and, you know, that God's focused on this one little planet out of all those... The sun The sun goes up, the sun goes down, no one can, no one can explain it. That's right. <laughs> Bill O'Reilly. can't explain that. The tide comes in, the tide comes out. Nobody can explain it. Yeah. Nobody can explain it. Um, you know, uh, it, it must be Azathoth. I mean, that's <laughs> the only possible explanation. Um, no, I don't think people really have a, a people don't have a grip on that level of per, that perspective. And I think it's it's mm -hmm. and in Lovecraft is correct that it's a good thing we we don't. It's a good thing that we just focus on the problems <laughs> in front of us and solve them. You know, uh, we just make sure that, you know, mm, Throg hungry, Throg need, you know, wolf skin, now Throg much warmer, you know, <laughs> plus bonus uh, wolf steaks, you know, you know, Throg have a good day. That's pr that's what we're capable of, of, of sort of dealing with uh, on average. And so, and it's not a bad thing because, you, you know, you, uh, you manage to get through your day. You manage to raise families and take care of your kids and not navel gaze, worried about the heat death of the universe, which, oh, no, you know. Uh, well, you know, the, the, there's a scripture in, speaking of religion and all that, there's a scripture in Proverbs that I think, often think of in reading Lovecraft and Lovecraftian themes and goes something like, uh, in much wisdom is much grief, he that increases knowledge increases sorrow. You know, you, you 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 realize that the universe is not all about you. You realize how big it is, and you're just this little this little speck. You know, it, that doesn't make for for happiness, I suppose. Well, even knowing about it, but yeah, you know, 
<coughs> knowing about it isn't the same thing as really understanding it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all aware of the of the scale of the universe now. We're all aware of the fact that certain cosmolo cos cosmic events could squash the planet Earth at any moment, you know. And uh, you know, we can either uh, you know we can either work on getting our bills paid for tomorrow and getting to work on on Monday, or we can um, sort of grind to a halt uh, like. Um, like uh, 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 Woody Allen would always just, you know, and I saw those films in the 80s. At some point, there'd be this obsession about, um, you know, oh, but there's this thing, there's death, and what happens next? And oh my God, that, mm -hmm. you know, what, I need to, we need to have a discussion about this again in yet another movie about death. And, um, you know, and uh, okay, well, while you were worrying about death, the rest of us, you know, gathered some nuts and berries or, wrote a novel or um, composed some music or built a pyramid while you were worrying about death. Um, yeah, there's a Bloom County cartoon from the 80s, uh, I always think of, where the I forget all the characters' names, but the kids learn about, you know, the big crunch and the universe, how the universe is going to end, possibly. And so one of them goes into his dad and he goes, screw the lawn, Pop, I'm not mowing it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, listening to Blair, sorry, Blair, uh, you were being so um, grim, Mr. Ivy, I almost referred to you as, as Blair Reynolds. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, but um, when you and when you ever bring up the heat death of the universe, uh, you know, I, uh, I have a slightly different view of the mythos, even in a Call of Cthulhu game, uh, and that is, is that... Um, uh, based on even the writings of Lovecraft where he talks about uh, particularly Shadow Out of Time and gives you this big, you know, sort of eagle-eye view of the possible timeline. He's he's throwing out, um, he throws out an Australian physicist from the 24th century as one of the one of the prisoners of the Yuthians uh, and, and, and Nakatis. And, um, again, we're in the 25th century. And, um, uh, on the one hand, that suggests that human civilization is around uh, in some Western European form, in the mm -hmm. recognizable form in the 25th century. Uh, and so it's like, oh, well, we can all relax now. You know, uh, Clearly, we're going to make it that far. Everything is going to be fine. And, and I've heard people say, well, that's, well we, you, you can't. You can't uh, pay attention to that number. Obviously, uh, that physicist must be living in a bunker, you know, under Australia, whilst Chagas roam the outback, and it must be some some howling, nightmarish uh, uh, Cthulhu future. But I'm like, not necessarily. And what does it matter? And, and and what does it matter? It so we make it another 400 years. What does that mean in geologic time? Exactly. I mean, yeah, your your end times are right around the corner as far as geologic time goes. Um, as far as human time goes, you know, okay, so it's a couple more generations. Yeah, you know, even more than the size of the universe, I think it really hits home when you uh, see these graphs or charts where if you put the age of the universe into a 24-hour yeah. day, humans basically came along in the last uh, minute or so. Yeah, uh, before seconds. Midnight. Seconds. Yeah. So... Yeah. so uh, a couple extra seconds is, or, 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 or portions of a second aren't going to matter to the mythos. You know? I don't think most humans realize how long the Earth, how many billions of years the Earth got along just fine without us before we came along and, a couple hundred thousand years ago. And second of all, I'm willing to, I, I am willing to uh, ascribe the same amount of self-serving bullshit that is found in, say, the Old Testament to the Necronomicon. Uh, you know, I mean, oh, look, it says in the book we're all going to die when the great old ones come back. I'm like, yeah, it said that in Revelations, too. Yeah. You know, how, how come the Necronomicon is so much more accurate a gauge of uh, the future as any other human, you know, human and, you know, old book? Uh, so, 
I don't mind that some of our cultists may be off the mark, too. I think it's even more hilarious if these guys who have been slicing open the bellies of children so that they can get the, you know, inside track on how the universe works and, you know, be somehow part of the it crowd because they were the ones who were willing to do the things to, to really have an understanding of the universe, to really know. Turns out they're wrong, too. That, you yeah. know, whatever... Whatever Ironically. universe that they thought was existing is they're just as wrong as the rest of the monkeys. It, it's funny you bring that up, Scott, because you know I, I have a new novel coming out in in what I don't even know August September, and I actually Got talk it. about that and that there's this guy. It's actually uh, Olmsted from the Shadow of Rinsmith, and he's he's sitting there going, "Oh, well, Cthulhu is our god, and Dagon and Hydra, and the, everyone at the tables looks like, yeah, you don't know anything." You, you read it in a book that was written 2,000 years ago by people who had their own viewpoint, their own idea, and they lied, they got it wrong, and now we're going to let you in on the real secrets. Yeah. Um, it's the same well, kind of... Yeah. Now, the, the problem is, of course, and, and the, what it were, you know, that applies to Delta Green is, um, whether or not, it doesn't matter whether they've got the inside track on the universe. It doesn't matter that the, whether they've got the, uh, the, the cultists or the, the human interaction factor. They're still playing around with forces that will crack the earth like an egg if they poke it the wrong way while they're trying to use it to achieve more power, more money, a bigger penis, whatever pathetic monkey goals they have that they're trying to tap, you know, they're trying to tap into the universe to get. You know, um, they're going to get the rest of us killed for their, you know, selfish, petty, again, you know, not much more advanced than the average Bonobo's goals, you know. And uh, Delta Green's job is to exterminate these assholes before they get the rest of us killed, uh, you know, because of their fantasy little power trips. Um, yeah, so speaking of that, I've got that's, a... That's the, the brighter, cheerful, that's the brighter, more cheerful version. Yeah. <laughs> At the Lovecraft Easing website, I've got a link to the Delta Green Kickstarter on the left side of the page. Um, can you, you and Shane, tell us a little bit about these two collections, almost two, I guess, as Shane keeps saying? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of stories are in these books? What can we look forward to? <clears throat> um, well, let's see. The first one is uh, the, the, the first book, the one that's funded already, is uh, collections by uh, stories by um, by Dennis Detweller, and so and it's it's bracketed by a couple of stories by Robin Laws, and so Dennis's stories uh, one is uh, intel and, and a few of them are, are online that you can you can read as, uh, if if you're curious about them already. So their intelligences is about. Um, it's about the the uh, a navy office where there is an investigation into what happened in Innsmouth and and uh, and, uh, and a, an, a, an investigator or a navy officer or agent who um, who kind of <clears throat> digs up some disturbing things and and has some ugly repercussions for him um, and then uh, the, the, there are a couple of stories set in World War II and then um, and then uh, and, and then there's another one called Punching that's sort of the, the aftermath and then it looks at a at a, a Delta Green agent who was, uh, you know, fought through World War II and afterward and has kind of, you know, lived this very violent, uh, very violent life that's uh, left him with kind of not much to actually, uh, actually live for. Um, and uh, and then there's a there are, there's a there's a story that's about ghouls in New York City in the in the 1970s and uh, living in the in in and under the the subways and um, that uh, the Delta Green agents in the in, in 1977 have to deal with and um, I'm looking forward to reading that one for. For a couple reasons, New York subways, mm -hmm. and for whatever reason, I don't even know why. I'm always fascinated by by stories. I told Rick this: uh, mm -hmm. stories and movies set in the '70s. So yeah. Well, you've got uh, just in that you got Far Below, which was written in the '40s, 
which dealt with ghouls in the subway by Robert Balfour Johnson, which was a mythos story. And we were talking about Midnight uh, Meal Train by Clive Barker. Yeah. Which is, I think, I think that was at the 80s? I guess yeah, that was. The 80s. Yeah, the movie was more recent, Midnight Meat Train. And it's a movie, of course, but that is this similar concept mm. of bulls in the subway. Well, it, it's right there in Pickman's model. One of the paintings right. yeah. that, that's discovered is, uh, is ghouls assaulting <laughs> or uh, ravaging the, the, the passengers on a platform, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's uh, you know, having lived in New York City, it, it's it's uh, it's it's not hard to in any to any time you actually are on the subway to kind of get a feel that there's got to be some god awful things happening just out of sight. Uh, it was well, a photograph from life. <laughs> well, the one thing in in that J Johnson had a New York Police Department agency actually assigned to exterminate the ghouls secretly. <laughs> yeah. And if you see at least the movie version of uh, Midnight Meal Train, not so much the story, it kind of takes that idea and goes in a different direction with it. Why do I remember an episode of Monsters way back in the day? Uh, Muir Monsters was, you know, was one of those things like Tales from the Dark Side. or um, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they had, I'm pretty sure they had a, a one that was actually, uh, actually involved a... a Unit of the Newark Police or Newark Transit Police that's trying to exterminate the creatures who are living in the subways under the city. Um, these sort of albino, you know, hairy yeti ape, you know, carnivorous <laughs> ape things. Um, and the the line that I always liked about that from that episode, where you know the guy from the from the accountant office comes down and wants to know why the guys in this division get three times the pay of any other police officers, you know, and why is so much money being spent in this division when the city's going broke? And the truth is revealed with the monsters down there, and, uh, and he's like, my God, how long have they been here? And the guy in charge says, well, why do you think the Indians sold it to us so cheap? Yeah. Um, I, uh, that may be the adaptation of Far Below. I've heard that line before. It, it sound, when you're describing when you're describing far below, it sounded like perhaps that was an adaptation. If and if only we had one of those magical devices, which with we could uh, gather information from the firm, <laughs> we could we could check this. Star, I'll, I'll 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 look and see if I can. Yeah, ideally, it. ideally, Scott, it would be it would be searchable where you could yeah. enter up <laughs> search clear. terms and be able to come up with something. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would also like to point out about the seventies in New York. There's no. The seventies are a particularly apocalyptic time for America. Uh, some of our top flight apocalyptic literature comes out of the seventies because there seems to have been this attitude that the fucking party's over and that America yeah. is done as a nation. That, you know, we're being humiliated by um, you know, we're being we're being humiliated at home by our own politicians being crooks and having to resign and uh, we're being humiliated overseas by um, you know, Barefoot uh, uh, savages holding our our personnel hostage, and well, thankfully it's... Reagan came along in '80 to save us. And yes, and, <laughs> and go into business with those barefoot savages and sell them arms because that didn't backfire. Um, well, you got, no, but... you got Children of the Kingdom too, set in 1977 during the New York City blackout. Yeah. Uh, well, there's also that New York City was going broke, and and Ford's not going to bail the city out and I mean I think I, I think people thought that it was going to be Lord of the Flies uh, in Manhattan before 1980 that we were I mean the 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 whole thing from escape from New York where the center yeah. of all we're gonna take the center of all culture and business and wall it off because you know it's done you know it's such a hellhole yeah yeah it's such a hellhole we're just gonna wall it off one That's of the headlines we're... At that time in New York City was Ford to New York City, drop dead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Daily news. Yeah. Was it? So uh, you know, the seventies are a particularly bleak outlook period period of, of time. They're an incredibly bleak outlook. Mm -hmm. You also have that movie that I really like, Rick and Pete, that we've talked about. Um, uh, what is it? It's uh, it's based on Richard Matheson's short story Button Button. Oh, the box. Oh yes, box. That's yeah. 70s too. Which they oh, they didn't Richard. have to do that. They did that deliberately. 
that it's the story is very different because you can read it online on the Tales of Mystery and Imagination website that I posted. And isn't I was surprised it, how different it was. Isn't it the Chinaman yeah. box? Isn't it that what it was called originally? Was the Chinaman box? Yeah, the Chinaman bo the Chinaman button. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Very, yeah, I, uh, I'm not sure what was going on with that. Because the, the, if you read the story, the whole resolution is kind of much different than the movie. Less. Well, all it is like a third into the movie, movie, basically. Yeah. I mean, it's like. You, the the person who pushes the button actually causes the death of somebody the person knows. Yeah. Rather oh, than, somebody rather they know? than the whole, you know, with somebody you don't know, and you know, and it comes well, back to screw I don't, you. I don't hmm. want to get off on a side tangent here, but I gotta say, in regards to that, that I I've always felt that the that the since I've saw, seen the movie and then other other adaptations, that Richard Matheson's resolution to that story was. The inferior one. I didn't like I, the way. I he totally agree with you on that. It's inferior yeah. resolution. I don't want to give too much away for those who haven't seen it, but but. Uh, uh, by the way, we got a lot of, lot of people watching live. Ken Scroggin says, "I'm so glad to see some of the Delta Green crew on the live chat. I've been frantically, fanatically, sorry, following Delta Green since its inception in the Unspeakable Oath. It's the number one rated game." On both RPG.net and RPGGeek.com, 50,000 gamers can't <laughs> can't be wrong, and if they are, I don't want to be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like Scroggins, except mm -hmm. strangely there was no profanity or squicking. But all right, we'll, we'll take your word for it. That was really Ken Scroggins. Well, then he, he ended up with that fucking Mike Davis needs to leave the show. But I <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's definitely Ken Scroggins. Well, I shot him down. No, I made that up. Sorry, Nobody, nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we've been very lucky that the stuff was well received, um, and we've been even luckier that uh, someone like uh, Shane uh, Ivy came along to uh, 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 to uh, uh, pump some new life into the product, and uh, you know, uh, you know, dial us up from uh, uh, iron lung status to you know merely uh, merely uh, IV drip status. I mean. Oh. You know, <laughs> The, the the product was uh, uh was definitely in a, in the doldrums when Shane came along and uh, began pushing for uh, 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 new production and uh, new products. So um, we were we those of us who created it were very lucky that uh, uh, that Shane was there to to help us out with this thing. And, and yeah, so help me out with that, Scott and Shane, because I'm not clear on this. Okay. Um, Shane, what's your position with Delta Green? And it sounds like from what Scott just said that Scott was one of the creators. You came along and breathed life into it or something to that, to that effect is what I'm Well, um, so, yeah, Delta Green was, was created. It was originally the, the concept. The first concept was created by John Tynes, John Scott Tynes nowadays, mm -hmm. um, who uh, in, in The Unspeakable Oath, which is the, the Cthulhu, mag uh, Cthulhu gaming magazine that, uh, that he founded and... We relaunched a couple of years ago, so um, and I'm I'm uh, editor in chief of that nowadays too. So um, and Let's then stop. let me stop you there real quick for yeah. for the people that would want to subscribe to that magazine. How do they do that? Uh, go to theunspeakableoath.com. Okay. And you can see all about it and uh, the most recent issues and and, uh, okay. and and learn learn plenty about it. And it's on Facebook too, but theunspeakableoath.com has has all the okay. all the goodies. Yeah, okay. thanks. So, um, so, so Tynes came up with the sort of the root of the idea, and then he immediately was uh, began working with and corresponding with Scott and with Dennis Detwiller, and um, sort of putting it all together and developing it into a much more kind of comprehensive treatment of the Cthulhu mythos and the way it might look in uh, in the modern day. And of course, at that point, the modern day was the early mid 1990s. Um, and uh, but the but the work that they came up with, and Scott had been um, had been a big uh, a big fan of the kind of uh, majestic conspiracy theories uh, from from way back when that the, that the X Files was so in love with, and so that kind of informed a lot uh, informed some of the background. Uh, oh. oh. In a, in a way that was very kind of compelling and, and, and convincing. 
And, well, let, me, uh, let me just correct you slightly. Uh, John right. actually, John actually introduced me to Majestic Twelve. As oh, well, did he so, really? All right. As a conspiracy theory, yeah, I have been a well, I have been aware of the uh, UFO mythology about the Men in Black uh, and mm -hmm. certain government conspiracy aspects for a while, but I was not aware of the uh, Majestic Twelve thing, which I guess came. So out... So, guys, they told you we'd get to UFOs. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah. Oh yeah. We, which I guess the Majestic Twelve thing came out in the '80s. Was was first put forward in the late '80s uh, by some guys who supposedly had some briefing photographs of briefing documents mailed to them. I believe is how it works. Yeah. And um, uh, I, you know, I, I very quickly once I, once John suggested that I was able to find. Some things. John's parents were apparently in some, you know, UFO reporters or observers uh, group when when he was a kid uh, in the seventies, um, in the eighties. Uh, so he had you know, something like MUFON or NICAP. Yeah. Um, but so he had he had had some exposure to that early. No, I was going to say that the, what what really uh, informed a lot of Delta Green was my um, uh, job search uh, during the during the 90s, uh, early 90s, because I was looking for work in the federal government. Um, I was at a law degree at the time, and I was looking for a federal job. So I had done an enormous amount of work on, you know, all these different agencies and organizations and things like that. And so when John said, I sent him some of my Men in Black stuff that had, I'd also sent to Challenge Magazine, and they'd rejected it. And I sent it in to John, and John's like, yeah, listen, about this Men in Black stuff, um, we there's something coming out in the next issue of the Oath, this you know game called uh, Convergence. So we're kind of stealing a march on you there. Sorry. And I read Convergence. It's like, oh, that's great. And he says, you know, uh, he says, are you work and I, I don't remember how we got around. It's like, are you working on anything a lot more along these lines? And he's like, yeah, we could be. So I sent him some stuff, and and he's like, yes, yes, this could be exactly what we're looking for. And basically, you know, that whole. Um, Agency template from the back of the book. I mailed that into him, and he was all like, "Oh my God, this is, this is what we were looking for. Um, uh, write something else, you know." Uh, and that's how we got started. How, that's how I got uh, brought into it. But the yeah, the original brainchild is is John's. Um, and we, you know, we did we we published for a while in the '90s and uh, early 2000s. But we were running out of Pagan's was running out of steam, and Pagan still exists, but only as kind of a hobby. I mean, um, I'll be very lucky if I get to get a product out this year. Uh, I'm, I am working on something, but I, it's all on hold because it's a one-man band here, and right now everything I'm doing is about the new Delta Green book. Um, and once I get done with it at the end of March, uh, early April, I'll be able to start working on this World War I uh, uh, anthology of scenarios that I'm, I'm trying to get out. But that's just going to... That's just going to have to wait until uh, Delta Green is uh, is all in Shane's hands. Shane came in, you know, um, as someone who was a fan of the work and, uh, you know, wanted to wanted to put in the work and wanted to, you know, when we were slowing down and running out of steam, and John's, you know, John's got this crazy idea. He's going to have a family and children and, you know, some people's shop. priorities are just yeah, weird. yeah, exactly. Same thing with Detweiler, you know. Um, uh, you know, Shane was, uh, Shane had already done the whole family thing, so he was, he, he was looking for something to, you know, actually hold his interest as opposed to his children, right? So he, <laughs> he came in and, uh, brought an enormous amount of energy and was like, you know, well, gee, if you won't lay the fucking thing out, I will, or I'll find somebody who will. And, uh, he just, you know, fucking came in swinging machetes until, you know, the field was cleared. Uh, and got a and just you know started getting uh, uh, products and projects that were dead in the water, moving again. Uh, How long ago was that, guys? That was like 2004. Okay. When, 2000, yeah, when, that, when that really started, 2004, 2005, and then uh, the the first the first big thing that we did was out in uh, was uh, when we put together Eyes Only. I guess that was 2007 when that came, when that yeah. came out. Yeah. yeah, and so uh, and then 2010, targets of opportunity um, came out. So uh, De Dennis and I founded like years and years ago. We we founded Arc Dream Publishing together, <coughs> and um, 
And so we were mainly for for a few years we were mainly working on uh, another game that he did, that he created with Greg Stoltze called Godlike, which is it was, the, it was something really that Dennis good. Dennis had pitched it to us, but we were like, gee, we can't even get our our cash cow Delta Green out quick enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he was like, well, gonna go find some uh, some other place to get this published. And he you know he and uh, Shane teamed up to make that happen. Yeah, well, it, it orig- originally it, it came out with it through a different publisher, and then um, and then uh, things happened, and uh, he and I put together Arc Dream to sort of take over publication of Godlike and its and its line, and then a couple of spinoff games from that. But um, but you know, it was no secret that I was a complete drooling fanatic for Delta Green from the earliest days, and uh, and so we kind of. You know, it was it, it, it that was a really early conversation. Was was what do we need to do to sort of get things get things moving again toward it? And it took a few years to get it to to kind of get it get get to a point where um where where we could really start making it happen consistently. And um, but uh, but once we did, you know, the the response has been has been really good. So it's been very satisfying. So, you know, so a matter of fact, for the audience, if you want to see a Delta Green game in action, and uh, one of the demigods of Delta Green, Shane here, running it, um, I've been hosting a Tuesday night Call of Cthulhu game. That's uh, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Mm-hmm. So what's that? Seven Central, five Pacific, and you can where you're watching right now. You can come on and watch us play uh, the Delta Green scenario live, and Shane's the the GM of that game, yeah. and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been it's been fun. It's been it's been interesting. You know, I'm I'm kind of um, I'm all, as a as a as a game master doing it live, especially in front of an audience, is kind of nerve wracking <laughs> but uh, you know so uh, and with Delta Green uh, my approach my approach to it running the game is kind of um, I don't know I, I kind of prefer a sort of a slow burn approach to mm-hmm. to that kind of horror rather it's, than it's, sort of... and it's tough doing that in a convention setting whenever I yeah, take yeah, to conventions so. it's it's really hard to peel that onion right uh, you, you, you've got to drop them into a horrible kind of quick yeah so, but that—that's kind of. I've been keeping my fingers crossed that, um, you know, that uh, my efforts to sort of um, build up a, a try to try to establish a sense of of sort of the characters being in an environment that has all the ingredients of um, of being terrible and terrifying um, would kind of start piquing their interest enough that uh, you know that 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 would pay off. Um, well, especially gradually. since you know we're in we're in no hurry. No one's in a hurry to you know damn it, hurry up and finish the game. There's nothing like mm-hmm. that. No pressure. No no no, no, the <clears throat> no no death threats. Yeah, and, yeah. So I hope people have been having a good time. I certainly have. It's been it's been really. They cool. seem to be. Uh, the only negative I can say is that uh, the Tuesday night gamers and the Friday night gamers now have a feud about which. Who's better? But <clears throat> I guess that's only good for my ratings. So. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, Rick, uh, the uh, episode of Monsters was titled "Far Below." It was based on Robert Barbara Johnson's story. Uh, it stars Barry Nelson, who was oh. the the very first James Bond in Casino Royale. Yeah, I, on, I looked it up television. too. It seems there's some, I don't know whether it's the whole episode, but there's at least an excerpt on YouTube. There's, okay, and I should also you know, point some, out somebody wants to watch it. Just oh, to get really? It. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and I should also point out most hilariously to me, not only is the first James Bond in it, but it's directed by Deborah Hill. Does that name ring oh, yeah. John Carpenter. Yeah, she really? was John Carpenter's uh, producer on a huge number of things: Halloween, The Fog, Escape from New York. Uh, the Dead Zone. She was a producer. Bach, on one of my favorite movies. Um, you know, uh, she's been a producer for a long time, and this is one only one of two things she has a IMDb credit for directing. So there you go. You got a John Carpenter connection. You got a James Bond connection. You have sort of got a Mythos connection. Uh, there you go. <laughs> far below. I've got a question. As you mentioned, Majestic Twenty One is based on at 12. least a real urban legend. Is Majestic Twelve. Not uh, 21. Oh, 12. Yeah, Majestic 12, I'm sorry. 
the uh, you, you also have this Nazi organization called the Karotechia. Yeah, yeah. The Karotechia is I, I've been asked about that a lot because uh, because it's not the Thule Society, it's not the Ananerva, you know, yeah. it's not uh, Sonda Commando uh, uh, Ache, you know. Yeah. Um, and everyone wants to know, okay, well, you know, where did you get it, Glancy? Where did you pull this from? And the answer is, it's a completely made up word. Yeah. It's a completely made up organization. Uh, it has, it is based on the historical, you know, reality of, of, of Himmler being sort of a, a, a consumer of all things, nineteenth and early twentieth century newage, you know. Yeah. Uh, he he was a he was a believer, and he he would have believed in you know. Sasquatch and UFOs, if they had been, you know, on the New Age agenda back in the 1930s, but you know, he didn't. Uh, he didn't have that opportunity. Um, but the word Karatekia comes from a friend of mine named Greg Gillum, uh, and Greg uh, put me onto this article uh, that uh, he had uh, somehow been exposed to. Uh, it was an article in uh, German or Polish. I can't remember which one. It, was, it might have been in German. It was about, I think, Sonderkommando Ha, which is Sonder Special Unit H, which was the uh, uh, office in the uh, in the Ananerba, the Ancestral Heritage Research Foundation of the of the, of the SS. The uh, Special Unit H was supposed to research the witch trials in Europe. That was the only thing they did. And they uh, went about seizing um, uh, ecclesiastical court documents uh, about the witch trials. Um, now, the, uh, there's a lot of question about what the purpose of this was. Um, you know, it's a, it's a lot like the Stalin monkeys, you know, monkey breeding thing. Everyone knows that story about Soviet scientists trying to breed great apes and humans. Nobody knows about that? No, we didn't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, once upon a time, you know, some 1920s Soviet era scientist put forward a, 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 a thing saying, hey, I'd like a grant to see if I can get a, a, a an orangutan or a gorilla pregnant with human, human sperm. You know, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I, I think that is so wrong. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the question was, and Stalin was one of the guys who, who signed off on, on this project. The question is, why did the Russians even try this? And well, the, the right answer is because they were looking for if they got a pregnancy, then they'd show a kinship between humans and monkeys, and then it would undermine uh, the church's creationism, and it would prove evolution was correct. And you know, or they were you can, really bored. Or you can say that that Stalin was breeding a giant army of man apes, <laughs> subservient man apes that would carry out his pogroms. The far more know. entertaining answer, and they're <laughs> popular. Un undoubtedly, undoubtedly, well, Stalin's head is in a see-through jar, you know, uh, with a bunch of spider legs under it, uh, moving it around the Kremlin. Uh, he'll guarded his, by his man apes. Yeah, yeah, guarded, guarded by something that looks like General Ursus out of. Um, you know, beneath the the H. H. Yeah, uh, well, you know, that's kind of the same thing happened with the Sonder Commando H. The, the, the likely answer is that the Germans were, were, were or the Nazis, really, yeah, between 33 and 45, they're Nazis. The Nazis were gearing up for an uh, anti-Catholic pogrom, at least Himmler was, uh, to crush whatever moral authority that the church had left in Germany, despite the fact that certain parties in the church were doing a pretty good job of cooperating with fascism mm -hmm. as it were. That's not good enough. They needed to make sure that nobody woke up one morning with a conscience and decided that maybe this wasn't the best thing for Europe. So Excuse me, I'll be of, right back. Go ahead. Go ahead sure. Please. So part of the deal was to try and come up with uh, crimes that the Catholic Church had, had committed against the German people. And the witch trials were going to be the evidence of that. that, that, that thousands of Germans were executed and tortured, uh, you know, for bullshit reasons uh, during these witch trials, and and gathering this information uh, with from Sonder Commando Ha was uh, all about getting together that evidence that would later be used against the Catholic Church. That's what it's probably for. But gee, isn't it so much more amusing if the Sonder Commando Ha is going through the witch trial records, trying to find out, you know, 
uh, where so and so's grimoire is uh, incurred, <laughs> or um, where the uh, where the various items seized by the church from uh, covens and you know, I mean, yeah. let's see, who gets wiped out by the Roman Inquisition? Um, Mysteries of the Worm guy, who's uh, L Ludwig Prin. Yeah, right. Ludwig Prin. Yeah, where's the goodies left over from Prin's, you know, trial and execution, and can we use it? to do something about this Normandy invasion that seems to be causing so much trouble. Or can we turn around um, the Battle of Kursk? Uh, you know, um, so that's where the, you know, my friend Greg saw this article, and the title of the article in German was something along the lines of The Science of Magic. That was the title of the article. And um, he tried to remember the words in German and failed. He, he came back only with this garbled, title of Karotechia. Techia having something to do with the German word for science or, or close to it. But he says, you know, Karotechia, and he threw, said that to me, and I'm like, well, you know, that name or that word stuck in my head. His garbled, poorly remembered German stuck in my head, and that became the Karotechia. And admittedly, the Karotechia are very pulpy. You know, of all the elements in the original Delta Green, they are probably the most four-color and, and pulpy of all the stuff. I mean, you know, uh, uh, they've got a, they've got Narlathotep masquerading as Hitler, you know, showing up <laughs> to give them directions. You've got, uh, you know, immortal cannibals. Uh, 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 you've got uh, frozen scientists. And that frozen scientist thing, the guy who's got the Dr. Munoz cool air problem, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, uh, in the Karatekia, that was heavily inspired by a shitty... Frozen British, Dead. The Frozen Dead. That was heavily... Dana Andrews. Dead, yeah. <laughs> Where Dana Andrews, instead of, you know, being chased by the demon in Night of the Demon, he is now some Nazi scientist trying to resurrect all these frozen German uh, muckety-mucks, Nazi muckety-mucks, in England. I don't know why they're in England, not in Germany, but all right. That, that but, is the uh, living girl's head. Yes, and yes, then there was that head. Where they have to, they preserve the head of the, of the murdered girl so they can do experiments and look in through her brain and, and like you do when you decapitate somebody and preserve their brain, naturally she becomes the lord of the dead and can reanimate the undead body parts. I mean, well, if Herbert West taught us anything, it's that you don't you don't decapitate you don't resurrect a head. That's just <laughs> bad one, one, one of the problems with all these movies where they resurrect the head. You don't have any vocal cords, so none of these heads could be able to speak. That is blasphemy, <laughs> um, and, and clearly wrong because clearly they all talk. Right? Yeah. You know? Did you not so see the movie, Rick? They talked. Yeah. So well, you're well, wrong. Well, you know the French Revolution theory, right, about human heads? Four, yeah. What? Fourteen blinks. That 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 for like two minutes, see the head can survive, and they said. None of the, the, you know, the eyes moved or the mouth well, yeah. moved, but no words came out because they didn't have vocal cords. Well, mm -hmm. and apparently there's a, there is a story that's been oft repeated that some physician who's going to be executed uh, vol you know, sort of had some assistant stand by to count the number of times he could blink after he was mm -hmm. decapitated. Presuming that be, oh, I'm the, the decapitated head blink counter. Yeah to determine how long the head stayed conscious after it was decapitated. And apparently the, the story from that is he got 14 blinks in, which is not a good story. <laughs> that is not, I'm not, I am not made more comfortable in my life knowing that you can get, you can get 14 seconds of, oh, wow, I'm probably not coming back from this. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to make it. Yeah. yeah this there are an awful lot of forms of instant death that are way less instant than you might wish. Well, yeah. Well, that yeah. was that, that was considered the humane way to kill somebody back then, or you possibly know, just efficient. Well, well, like, well, because hanging was done so you know before they had gallows, it was like they pull you up with a rope, like in that Robin Hood movie with Kevin Costner. No, no, and they you got strangled. That you know, it wasn't a, a quick way to die. Your neck didn't just break. We we still do that in Iran, so that 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 uh, they they still use uh, construction cranes. Yeah, uh, to pick people up with. So don't worry, that's still used somewhere. <laughs> don't think, don't fret. That particularly inhumane form of execution is still in the books. Thank so for the, um, for the beginning gamer or reader and reader, let's say, 
uh, I guess two questions. Where should they start? What 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 would you recommend? What Delta Green scenario should they start with? And someone who's not a gamer, they're a reader. What collection do you recommend that they start with? You mean fiction or gaming? I mean, because I mean, both. I mean, you start with the Delta Green original book, which is still available. Uh, you know, as a P print on demand or PDF through Drive Through RPG. Um, mm -hmm. As far as books go, um, I'd also recommend the. The, the, the first two collections aren't, aren't terrible uh, in that they are some of the earliest uh, Delta Green Alien Intelligence and Delta Green Dark Theaters are both, you know, um, uh, they have some of the earliest stories and some of the, uh, you know, some of the characters that John Tynes and Dennis Detwater pick up and use again. Yeah, I haven't read them yet, but I, it looks like I've got Dark Theaters and Through the Looking, Through the Glass Darkly or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Inns uh, Mouse story I liked. It was thanks, one of Rick. Three. That was that was mine. Oh, okay. great! Which one is yeah. that in? That's in Dark Theaters. There is a story in Dark Theaters, and actually, it's actually been reprinted in Book of Cthulhu, to, Book of Cthulhu Two. Oh, well, then I have two uh, copies of it. One, once uh, more from the top, and that yeah, is. Yes, I want to read it twice. Yes, uh, it only gets better the second time. <laughs> um, I think I think uh, the version that's in Book of Cthulhu Two. Uh, it, uh, benefits from the fact that I took out all the bad Innsmouth accents. Um, when Wolfcraft wrote Zodak Island's monologues in um, Shadow of Innsmouth, he has this terrible, you know, he writes the accent in. Uh, the yeah, story. you know, no matter who the author is, I have never been a fan of that. Yeah, and I did that in the first the first version because, well, Lovecraft did it. It must be okay. Mm -hmm. And and it comes out and, and and reading it, you know, however many years later, ten years later, I'm just like, oh my god, what was I thinking? <laughs> so I went back and took that out. That that is the one thing I changed uh, between the two versions. Um, but. Uh, um, Dennis has got a story called Night in Water, which is in um, uh, Dark Theaters, which is a good uh, World War II story. Um, I've got a World War II story in Alien Intelligence um, uh, called An Item of Mutual Interest, which is just one of your standard, you know, we found this diary in an airplane wreckage in Antarctica, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's the, that's, the, that's kind of interesting. The troubling part is it's a uh, Fock Wolf 200. And it's crashed in Antarctica. Hmm, I wonder how a Nazi airplane got to Antarctica. That actually influenced me in an interesting way. I got this round robin from Pete where they were hinting at something with the Nazis in, in, in Antarctica. And I said, no, they've already done that in Delta Green. So I had to, so I had to shift it to the Arctic to do something a little more original. <laughs> You can put them up up in Thule and 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 and, and um, uh, Greenland. It's it's Iboria, right? Yeah. That must be that must be lost in ancient Thule for sure. You know. And it, I ended up referencing the polar city from uh, Ch Challenge from Beyond, which I figured had to be in the North Pole of the Ithians. I put them in the North Pole. Another outpost. Yeah. Um. So I uh, yeah I'd, I'd say start with some of the earlier stuff that's all available through Drive Through RPG. Um, going chronologically doesn't hurt. Just going through it uh, uh, chronologically doesn't hurt. Um, you know, Tynes' Rules of Engagement does a really good job of uh, showing you, the, you know, sort of Delta Green uh, during its, you know, I don't want to say the heyday of the gaming era in the 90s. And uh, uh, Dennis's Through a Glass Darkly shows you Delta Green as it is the old days are running out. And it is no longer convenient or safe to operate the the conspiracy the way it was operated in the nineties. Um, uh, Through Glass Darkly is sort of a sequel to the Rules of Engagement. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So uh, I I'd, I'd recommend that. I mean, um, uh, again, they're all available. Um, everything's available right now through uh, Drive Through RPG. You shouldn't be any trouble getting their hands on anything they want to get their hands on. And of course to remind everybody uh, you can go to the current Delta Green Kickstarter through my website. Just go on the left sidebar and uh, there's some cool rewards uh, that you can get and you'll be funding these two books. So, have we uh, have we name dropped uh, things like uh, Chris Carter yet during this? 
Uh, no, but we can. Okay, I, it's always worth mentioning that you know uh, when John wrote uh, Convergence and published it, and I guess ninety ninety one. Um, I was in law school at the time, and uh, just by accident, I was house sitting for a friend when the very first episode of the X Files was being broadcast, and I I was flipping channels and just flipped in to the pilot episode right when they drop the casket that they're exhuming. Oh yeah! And it rolls down and breaks open. The body's all horribly mutilated, mutated, and twisted inside the casket. And I didn't know what the fuck I was watching, but I knew I was going to watch the rest of. You know, that's all I was new for sure. And I got done seeing 40 minutes of the episode, and I, I went immediately to the phone and called John, and I'm like, okay, John, there's this thing we need to be aware of. And we, were, we were right in the middle of writing material for Delta Green. I mean, most of the stuff had been written by then and was just going through a, an editing and a, a you know a, a layout process, but then we got it got delayed because uh, there were other books in the queue at Pagan uh, Publishing, including, I want to say... Um, the Golden Dawn, and uh, I want to say Realm of Shadows may have been also in front of it. Um, and those were getting published first, so, uh, you know, Thalsgren doesn't see the light of day until 96, which is two years into the, I guess, two years into the X-Files run. But um, uh, when it came out, and we started to feel the, that upsurge in the first two seasons of the X-Files, and the, uh, and the fans, you know, we, we were like, we, we could tell that we definitely tapped into something that was going to be big for the 90s. And uh, it, it won't hurt anybody to get a feel of Delta Green uh, in a very, very, you know, uh, shallow way to look at things like the first few seasons of the X-Files, maybe first three seasons, four seasons, and and um, that other series that Carter did, Millennium. Millennium. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Millennium, yeah. Hell, they even had fucking South American Nazis. They even had the fucking Karateki <laughs> on Millennium, you know? <laughs> and uh, they were they were fighting over that piece of the True Cross. Oh, yeah. Mm. That was a good... And the sequence where the Millennium group goes and sorts out the Nazis, you know, where they just assassinate these guys. You know, there's no gunfight confrontation. They just... You know, these guys get in their cars to go to work and they explode. You know, um, efficient. They're, they're, yeah, they're just all murdered in their and murdered in their uh, in their wheelchairs. You know, um, by the Millennium Group. That that always felt very like a very Delta Green moment to me, right there. <laughs> where they're, we're, you know, yeah, he's in a wheelchair. Yeah, we're gonna use a sniper at a thousand yards. That's that's our. That's our, t our our go-to murder moment for how you deal with a cripple in a wheelchair is to is hit him with a, a ferret sniper rifle from a thousand mm -hmm. yards. We've um, had a little bit of that deja vu um, real, real recently with a couple of episodes of True Detective. Yeah. That, that yeah. has been blowing up the Delta Green fan base um, all over the place <laughs> because there are so many, um, I don't know, uh, I, I would, they're obviously drawing from the same the same uh, thematic well. Drawing from the same pool, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I am very sorry that everybody, in, in, in the words of John Todd, Charged to the internet, yeah, to spoil True Detective for him, and uh, and I, I I had that same experience. People, you know, the last person to say, "Hey, I'm sure you've already heard about this True Detective thing," and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." I mean, I don't get HBO. I don't have cable. I'll have to wait for the videotape, and or you know, and, and he's like, "Well, I got a videotape right here. You want a VHS copy?" And I'm like, "Yes." Yes, I will. I'll take one of those. And um, I gotta admit, I am sorry that I missed that moment. Yeah. Uh, episode two, I guess it is. And maybe, yeah. Do I say spoilers? Do I say? Yeah, I say spoilers. No, but, spoilers? I, 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 but we've I, been talking David, about it. We've been talking about it for the last few weeks, so everybody okay. knows. But but yeah. when when McConaughey is going flipping through the journal on the way back to the car when they're leaving that that bunny ranch, and he's like. 
I saw the Yellow King running through the woods. You know, when he reads that line out loud <laughs> after the episode one teaser where the the convicts all like, ah, she said she met some kind of king. You know, uh, she said she met a king, and I'm like, now if I had been, you know, had no clue what was going on. Mm-hmm. When the guy goes, ah, she said she met a king, I would have chuckled to myself thinking, wow, if I threw out a line like that during a Call of Cthulhu game, all uh, my players would just give me this look like, you bastard. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's that scenario. All right, you know. Thanks a lot, Glancy. There'd just be that moment of, you know, uh, of recognition and loathing that would happen when they realized what they were up against. But... I, you know, it's HBO. I'm not going to see the king in yellow. That shit's not going to happen. Never, you know, absolutely not. And then, you know, yeah, the next you know, episode. I'm happy that I, the show kind of grabbed me at first. I'm, I'm going to reserve judgment until the eighth episode is over with, but I'm starting to lose interest, you know. Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm not. Not at all. I mean, and, I, and I'm, I mean, I know, I know for a fact it's, you know, that the, the whole, the whole, Carcosa thing that they have going on is is not that's not the point of it you know it's sort of it's 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 using it's using that kind of fictional mythology as another mythology through which um, you know through which people justify being really shitty and evil to other people which yeah. which we just said earlier in this episode that's kind of one of the things that goes on in Delta Green really hard is that um, uh, is, is that uh, the scenarios, a lot of them are written. There's two kinds of scenarios. One is the scenario where you go up against the mythos, and I would suggest that, or the effects of the Lovecraftian universe, and I would suggest that that would be like Artifact Zero, uh, story by Den- uh, a scenario by Dennis Detweiler, where just it, it's the Schrodinger's, it's the Schrodinger's cat of of scenarios where. Just by observing the scenario and observing the problem and observing the mystery, you are doomed by it. Um, you have just by coming in contact with it. You have, you know, you you, uh, you. It's not that you have to do anything wrong except to perceive it, and now you're doomed. Um, it's a meat grinder of a scenario that can uh, gobble entire parties up and uh, leave nobody left. Uh, just 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 leave a, a, a gap where these people used to be. Uh, not even mutilated bodies, not even you know blood or viscera, just gone. Um, that is a very you know contact with the mythos kind of situation where um, it's just so much bigger than us that there's there's almost nothing you can do about it. What you can do something about are the idiots who are trying to have contact with the mythos, um, the people who are trying to manipulate it, use it, uh, be empowered by it, be emboldened by it, just like. Uh, these uh, these guys from uh, True Detective, um, you're you're not affecting the mythology. You're affecting the you know, your only your only point of effect is the people who are trying to make this work for them. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, it's mm-hmm. a lot of the scenarios are about you know uh, like um, trying to think of some other uh, Tellerwaller ones. Uh, certainly, Victim of the Art is about interacting with somebody who's who's a point of contact for the mythos, but you know, and you can you can affect them, but in say night floors, which is this very very king and yellow carcosa scenario, uh, it's it's another one where you can't affect the mythos, you can't affect uh, the where this place is bleeding through into a reality. You're only hoping the scenario is to maybe get a few people back from the other side, return them from carcosa to this world, but you're not going to fix carcosa. You're not going to have a raid on Carcosa. It's you know uh, th- those things aren't going to happen in, in a Delta Green scenario. Yeah, um, there, there are a lot of a lot of those scenarios where the the, the the sort of the point of it is to try to evoke the the horror and terror of interacting with with um, with something on that scale. You know something that that has that that that, that you're not going to be able to solve and fix and. Um, and it becomes more about either survival or just um, driving home that sensation of of facing something so um, deep. Yeah, um, yeah, you're not gonna, you know, again, uh, just because Cthulhu has hit points doesn't mean you're going to get to knock any of them off. Um, and I agree with some writers who suggest that in later 
later iterations of Cthulhu games that the Mythos uh, deities and the uh, great old ones shouldn't even have hit points um, because it creates this false impression that you can shoot it with a bazooka, uh, which you can't. It's, the evil is just not something you can you can fix with a uh, flamethrower. Um, and I've driven Mike away again. No, um, no, I had let the cat in. There's this <laughs> boss of the household, you know. I, I, I understand. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. Um, but yeah, uh, that that moment where McConaughey reads the thing about King and Yellow out for the first time, I really wish I had been able to get that absolutely cold. Re cracks open the book and it says King and Yellow Carcosa right across it. I would have really liked to have that pure moment of, holy shit, are they really going there? Did they really go open I'm, I'm, my I'm, I'm, what, my what, toy box and get out my toys and play with them on national television? The one time I went through something like that. <laughs> Was Mike and I have discussed this movie called Dark Intruder, which you know my oh, brother, yeah. my brother awesome. tells me there's this great horror movie I saw. You know, and finally I'm waiting for it to come on. It's only a show at two o'clock at night, so I'm watching ABC and I'm sitting there and I'm going, "Did Leslie Nielsen just say Avatar and Dagon?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, he did. Yes, and uh, and uh, and it's even better that it's Werner Klemper as the monster. Was his yeah. voice done by Norman Lloyd? Yeah. yeah, I'm not quite sure how that worked out, but apparently Werner Klemper's uh, voice was not good enough. Were you going <laughs> to say something, Shane? I've forgotten what I was going to say if I was. <laughs> uh, I also have that effect. Um, <laughs> so, but, yeah, uh, I, I'm interested to see how they're going to wrap up True Detective. We'll see. they got two episodes to go. They can certainly fumble the ball at well, any point. Um, I recommend a, a film called Kill List. It was uh, directed by the same guy that did a field in England, and uh, the Sightseers. You guys familiar with those movies? I like mm -hmm. Sightseers. No, but I, I've heard that I should watch the the Kill List. Yeah, and I think uh, it's free to watch. It's a commercial for that, and it was yeah. reminding me of uh, True Detective. Kill Kill List gets to a, the last two minutes, and then the the ending is so such a disappointment compared to the build up. I mean, it's it's an A plus. Movie. I was absolutely on the edge of my seat in the theater. I was loving every second of it. It was the best thing I'd ever seen. It was smelling like, you know, it had it, it smelled like some Delta Green universe. Not Delta Green, the game, but it had this feel of a modern uh, horror setting. Uh, it was much larger than the characters that we were seeing. There was something bigger uh, afoot. And it got down to the last two minutes, and the ending is terrible. And it, it's, all, it's so terrible, it made the other 35 minutes of the film seem bad. Um, wow. If you can forgive it, the, the, the last two minutes, uh, it is a really excellent film. I mean, they just didn't know how to end it. Uh, the well, build-up, the suspense, it's, it's amazing. And like I said, I'm reserving judgment till it's only fair to reserve judgment until the Episode eight of True Detective is over with, but I'm starting to get the feeling that it's, it's basically a very good, and I, it is very good, a very good police procedural uh, with uh, a few king and yellow red herrings, so to speak, thrown in. That's the feeling I'm getting. I'm, I'm curious if, if you looked at the the trailer for uh, the the next episode. There's some book that they're looking at. No, I, I was trying, I was trying to blow it up to see what you know you could you know see what the top of the title was. <laughs> They know they've got you. They know they got you. You're going through the fucking preview for next episode, one yeah. frame at a time, blowing up the pixels. <laughs> what the fuck is that? What is it? Oh my god! I, I couldn't read it, you know, so oh, I just I just gave swallowed. up, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. See now, I have not been watching the show because, like Scott, I don't have HBO, and I'm saving it for a binge watch. You know, I could convince my wife to get HBO for a couple weeks. It is hard waiting a week, so you're doing actually, the smart thing. I, I actually ran out and bought a TV and a cable subscription <laughs> when I saw the first episode of the X Files. When so, I realized that this thing was gonna, because I presumed incorrectly that it was gonna be like Twin Peaks. I'm gonna get 10, 15 episodes and it's gone. You know, it's never right. gonna survive because mm -hmm. Fox had been throwing out series at that time and they would just die, like uh, even, Strange even, Luck. Even back then, yeah. Uh, Briscoe County Jr. Yeah, uh, I was expecting this thing—the last ten episodes to be gone—and then suddenly, you know, it's nine years later, and I'm watching those shitty ninth-season episodes, thinking, "What am I doing here? Why am I?" 
So, wasting so, do, you remember, think, do you remember Werewolf on Fox? Oh, God. No, took, no, I, I do not. Chuck Connors, they had him as this great villain, and then they wrote him out rather crummily. Oh, I don't remember. I do not remember Chuck Connors. The Rivalman, right? Yeah. Oh, my no. God, no. Don't yeah, he played, he played a werewolf called Ganna Scorzeny, which was the same name of the vampire in uh, the Night Stalker. Okay. Yeah, and the, oh, and the yeah. same, and the uh, well, not the same name of the SS Commando, but close yeah, enough. That was, that was yeah, still yeah, Scorzeny, yeah. wasn't it? Everybody oh, loves Otto Scorzeny. Was yeah. the SS Commando? Yeah. yeah. Well, it obviously that. was not Fox because it was the '80s. But I've not had confidence in shows I like continuing since they canceled Auto Man in '84. <laughs> I think. <laughs> <laughs> You got burned you, early. You poor <laughs> bastard. Yeah. What was yeah. You guys remember that show? Remember that. Uh, do you, do yes. You, do you remember that show? It lasted like five episodes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember. There are a number of classic. God. Uh, Jonathan Banks from, you know, from uh, uh, who's had Bad. a big comeback in Breaking Bad. Um, is Mike. Um. He was in this incredibly shitty sci-fi series in the 80s uh, that was uh, set in another dimension where the family falls through into another world, and it's just, it's their sci-fi, science fiction world where they're dredging up all the, uh, the, the sort of, you know, the, 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 all the usual suspects, like Mark Leonard, you know, turns up on it for an episode, and I cannot remember the name of it from my life, but it was one of the things I got... Maybe nine episodes of it, you know, but God knows in 1985 I watched every single shitty episode just, just because there was no science fiction to be found uh, mm -hmm. in 1985. Uh, we were, it's not like today, you kids today complaining yeah. about your kids today serenity. Today. At least you got your serenity on DVD. <laughs> Back well, in my. You don't, even, you don't even, yeah, you, you don't even have to, you're, you're remote to the, what do they call them today? They used to be called VCRs. Uh, your remote isn't hooked up by a wire. It's actually wireless. <laughs> you guys remember oh, the, the VCRs in the 80s with the all we had, the All we had was the man from Atlantis, and we were grateful, <laughs> grateful for that, I tell you. Well, do you, do you remember when Kochak the Night Stalker first came on? That I was worried that that wasn't going to even last a full season. Yeah, it's another they kind of yanked it like after three episodes, and then it came back or something. Yeah, that's yeah, another one. Season, that, but that's a. But but we got at least one season. Uh, and I remember watching that on the CBS late night movie. That's where I saw my call check. Was that apparently there was a after the eleven o'clock news, uh, the CBS had this thing called the CBS late night movie, which really meant reruns. They just show back-to-back -back episodes of some canceled TV series. Like Scott, Coach. it was Otherworld. And there were these four Otherworld. Thank was, you very much. I am not... Okay. Because you, you just ran a Jonathan Banks search, didn't you? Actually, I pretty much knew that it was Otherworld because it was one of those move shows that my dad made me watch, you know, subjected me to, because it was the only science fiction on television. Well, well, I, I'm sorry. Uh, Child Abuse Hotline. What's the yeah. number? <laughs> yeah, there's numbers. There's a number you can call, and you can yeah. you can make them show. Yeah, they they have like an inflatable remote, and they just you know show them on the remote the bad show. Don't let this made, happen to you, kids. Yeah, he made you Look, watch. You yeah. see how he turned out. That yeah. guy would get me up on Saturday morning and make me watch Jason of Star Command. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, God. there's kid, another. Who wants to watch that? But I was just saying, going back to Kojak, the thing that. I what do you mean? We, we haven't even talked about Sid Haig yet. We just mentioned Jason of Star Command. Well, just just, just quickly, out. there were four episodes that CBS never showed because they made them into, like, movies. Mm -hmm. Right. The Aztec Mummy one and the, the Succubus one. And, I'm going, you know, and I was watching them go, what happened to those episodes? Uh, can I just point out, as long as we're talking about Star, uh, uh, Kolchak and we're here on the Lovecraft Easy, no one has mentioned that there was an episode called they were, they are, and they shall be. We've talked well, we've about it always been here a lot, actually. Pete, Pete, yeah, but not this time. Not while I'm here. <laughs> it doesn't count. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, a, then, that's one of my know, favorite one, episodes. That, that is actually, one... I find, really Lovecraftian is Energy Eater. Oh, though, yeah. that's the most. That is the single most Lovecraftian one of the whole pack. Yeah. I mean, 
Uh, that one, okay. and uh, my other favorite is um, what's the one with the uh, the horror in the heights. heights? Horror in the Heights. Yeah. The Rakshasa. Yes. Yeah, that's a really good one too. The, the Those are my favorite episodes. It's yeah. kind of like the Rakosh in F. Paul Wilson. Right now, you know, it's it's the last episode I think, and the, the monster's kind of cheesy. But oh, I really you, like the sent. What is it? The Sentry? The Sentinel? Sentinel. Sentinel. Yeah. Yeah, the Sentinel. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Sentinel. It does. It does bring the rubber Sudosaurus. Yeah. You, you can't deny them that they <laughs> they. Mm, yeah. Um, look, 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 look like something from Lost in Space that was left over. Actually, I, I looks like something from, I had just gotten into. I just realized I just that the into, Land of the Lost had better costumes. <laughs> I just want to point out, Land of the Lost had better costumes. I'm, I was, I was disturbed by Sleestack for years because. I, I, actually, the lizard men would have pretty well developed personalities on that. Yeah. yeah. All right, back to Delta Green because that's the most important thing ever. <laughs> That's why we're here. We didn't come on this show to talk about Kolchak and Land of the Lost and all the other things from our well, dusty... Well, thankfully you are a Kolchak fan, because otherwise I'd have to ask you to leave. Because we, well, you know, it, <laughs> we've, I, we're I, big Kolchak I, fans here on this show. I, my friend Greg uh, Gillum, the same guy who brought me the Karatekia, uh, had said that you know that the only thing that never made sense about Kolchak was, why does this shit keep happening to him? And yeah, he Rick really, said that too. He, yeah, he wanted the show to eventually. It turns out that he's cursed. No, Rick, or, you're. Or why does it? Why does it happen in Chicago? Yeah, yeah well, Rick's theory was that there's a hell mouth in yeah. Chicago. <laughs> no, 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 that's in Cleveland. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Yeah, that's yeah, the no, other that, one in Cleveland. It's, it's confirmed. The, the question, it's in Cleveland. The, the question I've always had is: is he's got to be the best reporter in the world because every other story gets canceled? Yeah. So, he yeah. so his, his, his coverage of the Tulip Festival was right on the money. So, <laughs> yeah. um, my, my favorite line is still from the Ripper episode where he's in there with the, the, uh, the woman at the massage parlor or whatever. And uh, he's trying to ask her questions about who's been in the place and she's trying to get him to lie on the massage table. And, uh, and she's know, a cop. Take, yeah, and eventually she busts him. But she says something like he's wearing a suit. She looks at his shoes and she says, Sneakers? And he says, I run a lot. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, if that doesn't sum up, call a Cthulhu right there, <laughs> god damn it. <laughs> you know, yeah, I run a lot. Yeah, you don't <laughs> stay and fight and call a Cthulhu. Or Kolchak. Let's be or honest. Kolchak. You whip out your you know what your 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 police special and the monster turns you inside out. Um that's never a good plan. You leave that to the red shirts. Show how the monster well, works. He was always lucky that were these librarians and uh, archaeologists that we could always dig up to get you know we know exactly how to kill the monster and and while simultaneously uh, while simultaneously not believing in it. Yeah. <laughs> you know they'd have the exact detailed data on how to fucking <laughs> put it into the problem. Old, and then Carl Kolchak had the ultimate weapon. He had that camera. And you know that drove away the monster, and I, I, and I think that <laughs> yes, was used twice. Huh? I think what, that, the... that that was used twice. In, in it certainly was used twice. once. <laughs> uh, and it was even better because uh, oh, the flash bulb works. You need to get big lights up, and then the the authorities get stomped like yeah, an art club maker rally, and you know, whoops! I guess that light there. I guess we misinterpreted. Sorry, my the bad. Data. Oops. Well, you know, he didn't kill the monster in the, the are they were they shall be. So mm. yes, it just fills up on bone marrow, belches loudly, and leaves Earth, yeah. which I thought and was it, marvelous. And it even that episode even has Men in Black in it because it's got the yeah. you know nondescript car with the nondescript guys in brown suits who you never directly confront, but they're well, there. Which we've talked reasons. about that. That may be the first Men in Black. Um, and that's like, that's probably the inspiration. That episode is the inspiration for the X Files, because Carter always cites Kolchak as a source. Yeah, yeah. yep. Uh, there, there's there's definitely some of that. Um, certainly, we were, you know, um, uh, the 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 Men in Black stuff had, you know, was definitely something that inspired my first, you know, foray into uh, into Delta Green. Although, when I originally wrote it up, uh, what I wrote up was not the idea that you'd be the Men in Black. Because I thought that, you know, would unbalance the game. 
the Men in Black would be the kind of thing that would turn up in a game and, uh, you know, possibly make all the evidence go away. You know, one of the, to solve the problem in a modern game of, hey, we got video of the Shoggoth, and then these guys turn up and say, thanks, we'll be taking that. Your country appreciates your service. <laughs> and then it all goes away. And then, you know, um, you start to realize that uh, your phones are bugged and you're being watched now. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe one day they, you know, they send you the package of yeah, uh, which clue goodies. There's a great scene in season one of the X-Files, if you guys remember, where Scully is like, they meet the lone gunman, that episode, and she's like, yeah. these guys, they, they just have to believe they're so important that they're being bugged all the time. And, you know, it makes their lives meaningful. And then she's fiddling with his pen and she says all this. And realizes there's a bug in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I, I just love that you know it, it, it the first time they start doing that surveillance stuff, it's like ah, uh, it's the it's the surveillance state, the super covert, competent, evil you know government nemesis is on the job, and like Moeller's on the phone and the phone is going clickety click click yeah. snappity pat pop, you know what I'm like? Yeah. And the yeah, van is parked hard. down the street where you can just <laughs> see it. And with the you know flowers by Irene on the side, you know, and and it's like wow, these are the worst covert operatives I have ever seen in my entire life. Uh, yeah, but it, kind of kind of true to life, it turns out. Well, yeah, I guess you know, which is why these guys don't exist. Why these conspiracies don't exist is because you know we do have bumblers and we do have guys who couldn't get jobs in the private field, and you know that's who our our spook services are, are manned by, you know. They were really had talent. They'd work for a private contractor like Snowden did. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I always loved about um, about Delta Green was that it, it, it a, a lot of the material kind of starts off with uh, a look at some particular um, conspiracy theory, you know, or, or piece of occultism. Uh, and this is a, taking an explicit cue from Lovecraft, who did this in a lot of his stories. But but taking you know looking at, at something and then saying it, looking at it sort of through an angle of what if there was something to that, but not in in a in the way that the people inside it want it to be. You know, yeah. so the so so with the uh, with the majestic twelve material that's in that's in Delta Green, and it's related to. To UFOs and the the Greys and and all of that stuff, um, you know the the whole idea there is is okay maybe there's something to that but what's really going on and um and 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 how do we present that in a way that is um that is kind of terrifying and spooky and way more awful than um than just saying yes there are really aliens in in flying saucers. Well, I think Dennis and John both uh, scored points on that. I no, I haven't. I don't believe I've really managed to take a piece of modern conspiracy theory and um, or folklore and work out the mythos truth behind the generally accepted, almost publicly known aspects of it. Dennis. Well, that was that was kind of the whole point of the Karatekia, right? Was taking well, some of these some of these sort of I get, over the top, I, goofy, pulpy. You know, the Nazis were all powerful geniuses thing. Well, and well I, I suppose there is, uh, maybe there's something there where yes, I put a mythos explanation behind the standard Nazi um, uh, Nazis in the occult um, sort of trope. Which is, you know, currently uh, and officially done to death, I guess, at this point. Um, well, well, you but did. I, it I, this but is, I, I, you, I almost, I almost didn't. Uh, I, I almost don't consider that as interesting as as putting the grays behind the UFO abduction, you know, mythology, or uh, the tilling gas resonator behind the Philadelphia experiment, like Dennis did. Those two things to me are, are incredibly brilliant because those, maybe because those conspiracy theories have <clears throat> so much more social cachet in the real world, I think, than the old uh, Nazis and the occult trope. Well, you know? well, well, one thing that, you know, when I, you know, when I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, I didn't realize that there were actually real Nazi expeditions to, like, Tibet and things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, not everybody, you know, I, I knew that, you know, this whole thing about it. Hitler supposedly being, it actually was Himmler being, you know, in the occult that had popped up in movies and things. 
But I always thought they really had guys looking for artifacts that would have to do more with um, finding. They wanted to prove that Aryan race. Uh, mm. Yeah, yeah, they, they, were, that's, they that, were up in the Himalayas measuring people's skulls and doing yeah. chronological examinations to prove that the... Uh, they, that they have a ton of amazing quack science. Um, but then again, and, and, and there's a lot of great quack science out there in the 1930s. Uh, there's a lot of it being, out there today. That's being, well, it was being used to support state... Uh, theories of state power, mm -hmm. I guess. You know. mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I remember asking uh, Ken Height if he could cite to me any quack science that was being used uh, in, in, in Japan uh, during the, you know, the <laughs> fascist period of Japan. And he was like, I don't know of any, but I can state with moral certainty that there was some. Yeah. Because that was the time period. Everybody had their... And he was able to actually dig up a few things, but there doesn't seem to have been, you know, any Japanese agency whose job was to... Uh, you know, locate and bind Oni or, you know, other Japanese, or Tengu or other Japanese demons and harness them for the war effort. Uh, okay, these smart asses on the message board wrote a few minutes ago, I left for five minutes and I come back to a room of angry old men complaining, yammering about old shows from the 70s and 80s, <laughs> telling us whippersnappers how good we have it. Welcome, yeah. welcome to the internet. That's I am right. not an angry man. <laughs> um, uh, just, just on the Japan angle, there was that weird unit in Manchuria that was doing biological. Yeah, yeah. Um, every, everybody loves Unit Seven Three One. There, there, there's any number. They did such horrible shit that if you make up shit, yeah, you know, it's going to be plausible because the right. stuff they actually did is so ghastly that it beggars the imagination. Um, but yeah, the stuff where the stuff that Galtrain really shined at was the ones where we could take uh, something that was a trope of standard, you know, uh, conspiracy theory and, you know, slide in the mythos uh, behind it. Uh, as, as, as you peel the layers off it, you get down to the mythos. And um, uh, I guess Ken and uh, Greg succeeded on, on, on a certain level with that whole... Um, uh, uh, the cult of transcendence, because we we took the standard trope of the Illuminati, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and all that stuff, right? Yeah, and managed to show that uh, they've accomplished nothing. <laughs> that they that the grand conspiracy hasn't done shit, uh, except fail for hundreds of years, which I thought was a hilarious take on that standard. Oh, they're behind everything, and they're right. yes, they had a hand in. Starting World War One, but it didn't turn out the way they planned. Or you know, it didn't, nothing, nothing worked. The 40, Thirty Years' War didn't play out the way they had it on the big, the big board they had in their office with all the armies and flags <laughs> on it. You know, he'll be able uh, to see the big board. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, you know, the World World War One is the one thing you can trace to a conspiracy. At least Franz Ferdinand's assassination of his. Weird black hand Serbian organization involved in that. Yep, yep. You got Serbian intel military intelligence and terrorists, and yep, it's a genuine conspiracy. What do you know? Um, um, Shane, when is the Kickstarter over with? When's the? How, how much longer does that have? March eleventh. So okay. We've got ten days. Ten more days. We can do. Th we can do thirty dollars in ten days. I think. No, we, we we've uh, we actually passed. Uh, we While passed, talking? Yeah. So, uh, uh, Behold the, the power of Lovecraft easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so that, give us that's an hour and we'll give you $30. Give me an hour I'll give you 30 bucks. Yeah, uh, so that's, that's officially volume two, and then we're going to awesome. basically be adding more stories to it uh, over, the next, uh, over the next week and a half that it has left. We've got a, already one by uh, Ray Winninger that sounds really, really awesome. Um that's uh, that's our next goal, and uh, and another by uh, David Mana, which is his <clears throat> going to be his first, I think his first published uh, Delta Green story. He's an Italian writer, and he's been a, a fan for uh, that we've been corresponding with for. He, he, he there's a there's a selection of, of fans out there who are excruciatingly talented, and Mana's one of them. Mana is a, is one of these guys. He's a paleontologist, um, but we've had any number of, of fans who. Have brought more to the table than we had. Um, 
I'm trying to remember, the, the, we've had a couple of guys who've been, you know, information and data security people who've been able to school us on on stuff like that. We've had, um, uh, let me think, um, uh, shoot, um, what's his name? Uh, who wrote the uh, files of Grant Emerson. Uh, that was written by... Graham that's Price. The, uh, Graham Price, you know, was an actual virologist and a biologist, so he was able to write these mythos autopsies for us that were just brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. We, which is far beyond our capacities, you know, to write that stuff. We never would have been able to produce that. We were very lucky that we had talented yeah, it's, fans. It's, it's, all, it's always so fun when we were putting together, um, we were putting together a bunch of uh, Deep Ones material for targets of opportunity a couple of years ago. It's, it's, it's great to have access to experts like Graham who can kind of back a, a, be a backstop on the science and, and help us make the, uh, the sort of pseudoscience where we, that, that we come up with sound just feasible enough to kind of trick your brain into, into and, and, into, and into wasn't shivering. that the whole point of what Lovecraft was doing with his uh, mm -hmm. the science and his stuff? I mean, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, um, again, you can go to the Lovecraft Zine website, <laughs> LovecraftZine.com, and you can click over to the Delta Green Kickstarter, learn more about it, and hopefully give and get some stuff in return on the left side menu. Um, oh, and I got I got to throw this out. I got to throw out yeah. the one the, the one time I got some you know we've got a lot of love from on this game. You know the fan reviews have been very good to us. Uh, the occasional person has stepped forward to say that we ruined Call of Cthulhu. Um, <laughs> that was that's always entertaining. Um, but when I was at the um, HPL Film Festival last year, Sandy Peterson was there uh, boosting for his game Cthulhu Wars, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, while we were there together, he says, you know, when I first heard about uh, this Delta Green thing, he says, oh, my God, I thought, he says, he says I heard about how it was going to, you're all government agents, and it's all like James Bond or the Men in Black or something, and he says, I thought, oh, my God, they ruined it, you know, they're, they're going to nuke Cthulhu, they're going to, you know, judo chop, you know, deep ones, and it's going to turn into this, just this, uh, you know, list of interesting monsters to kill, you know, and, you know, it's going to ruin the whole horror aspect of the game, and, I, and he says, and then he says, and then I actually picked up a copy and read it, and I'm like, oh, wait, it's more horrible. It's even more terrible and loathsome and, and awful to be a player in Delta Green than it ever was in Call of Cthulhu. And I'm like, okay, I that's it. We've been endorsed by the master. Right. We We made it worse. Right. Well, and and that's you know continuing and building on that is 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 a key a key challenge in the the new the new game the new RPG that we're that we're putting together uh, that we've yeah. been working on for the last couple of years, um, you know the uh, w w one one aspect of of the setting or one sort of conceit of the setting uh, that 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 was really effective at at delivering. Um, the, the terror was that the player characters were kind of isolated. You know, they were part of Delta Green as a an illegal conspiracy. They had they had very few resources and very little communication with other people that could back them up. You know, and and so everything that they were doing was um, was was to a large extent on their own, and that isolation was really really effective. Um, and but it, but it also was sort of um, a part. Uh, it, it kind of one of the thing reasons that it resonated was this is when it first appeared in the mid late nineties. Um, you know we were in a society that was kind of um, coming off of Waco. You know and coming off of um, of the the militia movement being so being so huge and and dangerous and um, and so the the notion that um, you know the notion that you're you're playing government agents, but who are kind of outsiders uh, had a lot of had a lot of resonance. So these days, the world there's a lot of things that are kind of that are that have kind of come back into vogue. But um, these days, we're sort of we have the the reality of um, of a really really far-reaching American government presence. Uh, in front of us all the time, you know, and then it's kind of it's, it's a constant it's a constant debate as to whether 
that's a, a, a you know a bad thing or a worse thing or a not so bad thing after all. You know, to have the the NSA in in everyone's business, um, sight unseen, and <clears throat> and all the rest of it. And uh, and you know, we're coming off of ten years of of the of the, the of a global war on terrorism. You know, that is kind of been used to um, to political ends, you know, to kind of extend um, extend American kind of government authority and stretch it in all kinds of new ways. And so one, one really fascinating part of developing a new edition of Delta Green as a game and as a fiction setting is uh, the opportunity to explore all of that in this fictional space. You know, and and address squarely the notion that, you know, if you want to play a character or write about a character who has, um, who has access, who has legitimate authority, um, and is going to use it in kind of illegitimate ways, then what are the implications of that going to be? So it's it's been putting it in the modern day and in the the now modern day as opposed to sort of the broad modern day that, that we've been working in for a long time. Well, has been yeah, has been a if, lot of fun. If it wasn't apparent to us Delta Green writers before, uh, I would have to say that uh, True Detective certainly does uh, uh, illustrate the fact that the '90s are now a period piece. Right. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. Um, that is no longer the, the, the that is no longer the the, uh, the 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 local context. It is now 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. um, well. The music I played on my my radio show in college is now vintage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, well, before we wrap up, uh, a couple things I want to touch on briefly. Um, well, the first thing is you mentioned Sandy Peterson a minute ago. I'll be at Sandy's house this week on Thursday, and so uh, probably a lot of gamers and people interested in Call of Cthulhu, Delta Green, watching this right now. If you have a question you want me to pass on to Sandy. I will. I'll pass those on to him and and do a do a short video with his answers, uh, or post both something like that. We'll get those answered. So email those to me at lovecrafteasing at gmail dot com. Uh, then I briefly want to talk about two other things before we go. Um, World War Cthulhu, and I keep getting requests to talk about Our Lady of Darkness. So uh, so let's do that. So. World War Cthulhu, P. You want to talk about that? Yeah, World War Cthulhu is a um, there's a kick. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's an Indiegogo. It's a new um, collection of stories uh, edited by uh, Brian Sammons and Glenn Barras. Um, it's going to be published by Dark Regions Press. It includes um, stories by John Shirley, Stephen Mark Rainey, Ted Grau, Pugmire, Bob Price, Ed Erlach, Neil Baker. Conyers and Kernot, William Michael, Christine Morgan, Cody Goodfellow, C.J. Henderson, uh, Daryl Schweitzer, Tim Coran, Jeff Thomas, and um, little old me doing a, a, a story called Cold War Yellow Fever uh, set during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, King in which, story, as I understand it. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. So it's, it's not, uh, it's military Cthulhu. It's not, it's military stories with Cthulhu and it not. Second World War stuff. No, it, and it's yeah, it's not. It's uh, actually, uh, I believe there are even some Roman uh, M, uh, Roman legionnaires versus Cthulhu. All right. Yeah, the very first story is set in 2087, if I remember right. So it, there's quite a range of, of time periods with that uh, yeah, war theme. It, it was the intent was not to uh, to do a cohesive story, but rather. Uh, Military men versus Cthulhu. Well, that, that's worth. I mean, that's worth noting because I'm afraid that my first blush looking at it was, you know, just oh, it's it's World War Two stories. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and you can if you look at that picture, yeah, it is. Um, okay. But it's not. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. It's not. Um, so uh, it sounds like a lot of the stories are are. Are setting out to sort of explore the Lovecraftian kind of story through, through combat and through the military or through, yes. through uh, that sort of. Or at know, least set it in at least set it in environments. Uh, I mean, Pagan is still working on our you know that World War One book, Horrors of War. Is, is the intention is to is to 
followed up with other books where the scenario is set during a conflict. You know, where uh, does a lot of the reason being you can get as make these these game scenarios as origin stories for characters later. Where if your character was in the Philippines during the Philippine insurrection and encountered something supernatural, they'll be they'll have a reason to continue being an investigator in the twenties. Uh, you know, or you know, and 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 uh, uh, be able to go to their army buddies who were there too and have a a investigator group based on previous experience. And the idea was just to set it in conflict zones where they get isolated, they're in faraway places, that get cut yeah, off but... from regular civilization because of the the human conflict. And then you know, almost anything's believable once you get behind that curtain of conflict. And it sounds like that's a lot of what they're going for with World War Cthulhu. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a couple Vietnam stories, a couple Revolutionary War stories. Um, Civil War? Civil War, yes. Mm -hmm. um, there's You've got, you got two dealing with the Trojan War. Yeah. Right. Future Wars. Um, there's a ch child, uh, kids in, child soldiers in Zimbabwe. Um who fucking needs the mythos at that point? I mean, <laughs> I you know, once they're once they're slashing the kids' arms open and packing the wound with cocaine and heroin to keep them fucking crazy out of their brain. Out of at their that point, I'm saying to the old ones, just just take the planet. Yeah, yeah. go fine. Take you, the planet because we've screwed it up. That's point, like that's like that David Drake story about oh, the they, Belgian Congo. They yeah. curse. Uh, they curse the darkness. Yeah. And the right. Curse the Darkness is one of the greatest mythos stories ever written, and it's an award. And it, technically, it's an. I mean, it has that war aspect, and the, yeah. the Force Publique is out there making war on the poor Congolese. Uh, and it, you know, we last time I was on the show, we brought up that one because it's the it's the it's the story that answers the question: Why the fuck would you be a cultist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah we did talk about that. That was an interesting conversation. Um, so, uh, World War Cthulhu, all right, that sounds much yeah, cooler I mean, I'm than the be artwork led me to believe. Uh, I'll be linked to that from the site, but I did link to it today from the Lovecraft Easing Facebook page. If you go there, facebook.com slash Lovecraft Zine. And it got quite a big response. I think people are looking forward. Yeah, to it, it's doing sense. well. We've got, like... Cool. And Brian, uh, did you say... Is Brian Salmon's... Uh, did you say he's he's editing it? Yeah, yeah. He and uh, Glenn. Yeah. He, he's he contributes to the Unspeakable Oath all the time. Right. Um. And uh, yeah, we go back and forth a lot. He's 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 great. Um, they they sent me a advanced review copy uh, to look at. I've read the first story. I'm in the middle of the second story. Stephen Martin Rainey's. I really enjoyed the first story. Uh, like I said, it's set in 2087. It's not this. Can't speak for the rest of the stories, but I'm assuming all are pretty much the same. It's, it's not this uh, we're fighting Cthulhu thing. It was it, it was yeah. different. And and the funny thing is that Scott was going on about how you can't beat Carcosa. Mm -hmm. And um, oddly enough, if you haven't figured out from my story, you know, Cold War Yellow Fever, it is a Carcosa story. And yeah, was, uh, I was going to say I thought it was King and Yellow. And I, I'm fully behind Scott on this. You you cannot <laughs> beat Carcosa. Um, yeah. And the best that you can do is hope to come out unscathed, and and that everybody else comes out not trying to kill you. We'll call yeah, that a win. It, yeah, as long as, you, as long as your zip code is not you know care of Lake Yatil, uh, you yeah, know, or Lake yeah, you're, you're all right. You're doing okay. Yeah. Lady or, you know, kill the guys who are trying to exploit it, but you're not going to kill the king in yellow. No, mm -hmm. you're not. <laughs> Actually, that's the fun part. You, I, I work really hard to keep all of that off screen because it, it, it's not necessary. Once once Carcosa manifests in your city, you have bigger, you have more immediate problems. Well, the, yes. <laughs> we, that's, what, that's where you draw the curtain on this sad, sad story. Yeah. yeah. Like oh, okay, so uh, check that out. It's I got it linked on the Facebook page right now, but I'll be I'll be posting about it on the site itself. What's the Matthew other Carpenter is camping. I understand it with his kids, but he wanted me to pass on that he did not care for Our Lady of Darkness at all. So 
I have uh, done that. You're going to have to bring me up to speed because um, again, I've been, I've been head... the book. Okay. Let me put you on the, speed. Uh, Fritz Fritz Go ahead. But hold that back up, Rick, please. There it is. All right, hold on. All right, uh, Conjure Wife, Our Lady of Darkness. You know, right. They published just the Our Lady of Darkness part. So what is it? Is it a collection of short stories by Lieber? You know, it's, no, Our Lady of Darkness is a is a novel. Was a, you want me to go into it? It was written yeah. in 1977. It's about this guy who's um, German-American like Fritz Leiber. He uh, writes for some sort of television show that so, this thing was called Weird Underground. It's sort of like in search of. He's a geek, yeah. Like a and he he discovers this book written by this crazy occult architect expert whose name is Thibault de Castries. Evo Evo Shandor. Yeah. <laughs> they don't build was it like Evo that. Shandor? Because that's my favorite <laughs> occult architect. Yeah. Well, we we'll, we'll get we'll get into the movie possible connections in a moment. Right. Um. He's basically sort of one half Aleister Crowley and one half Adolf de Castro, who was this cranky uh, revision client for Lovecraft who uh, did the last test in the electric execution of Lovecraft who wrote his stories. Yeah. He seems to be, he, I mean, even Liber almost says that because he brings in those real guys and saying, oh, he's kind of like them. But supposedly this, ar this architecture expert He's not an architect. He doesn't design any buildings, really. But he's hanging out with Jack London, uh, Ambrose Bierce, Clark Ashton Smith, and it's speculated he was trying to get them involved in the occult in some sort of uh, Golden Dawn type organization. And it's speculated that they all, you know, realized he was a crank and then just ignored him. Are you are you sure he isn't part L. Ron Hubbard? <laughs> There's a little of that too. All right. Well, when and, the, when the novel he, starts, the protagonist is is reading this guy's book, if I remember that correctly. Right, and it it's it suggested that he m may have murdered Ambrose Pierce and Jack London. You know, Pierce disappeared in Mexico. Jack London either took the wrong medication or uh, committed suicide. That's never been clear. Um, and he, never, there is, he never got over Jack Johnson winning the heavyweight championship. Yeah. <laughs> there, is, there is some reference to a uh, book by Thomas De Quincey which is sized from the abyss is the uh, English title. It's Suspiria Des Something Else. Size from the abyss. Are you sure that wasn't the the mythos uh, porn collection? <laughs> <laughs> no, oh. and and it's got a reference to th three women known as the three mothers who are uh, porn hand handmade into the goddess of uh, of uh, birth. And one is uh, one is the lady of darkness, and apparently uh, the Castri worships her. And um, he's always being accompanied by a mysterious woman who eventually turns out to be her. And he's set some death... He, he, like, the one guy he never killed was Clark Ashton Smith. So he set some occult booby trap for Ashton Smith, which the protagonist walks into, but he survives and defuses it. Uh, the reason why a lot of people don't like it, it's it's got a lot of nice nifty stuff in it but nobody really dies is it's it's got really no action in the modern era yeah but the novel's really a big part of the novel is the guy's got these reading reading and has these theories about skyscrapers and modern architecture being you know uh, these what do you want to say uh, occult kind of places or or whatnot Am I am I describing that right. correctly? Right. It, it, it's a book of ideas is the best way I can. Yeah. So, so I mean, I, I did go. like it, but I can see why some people don't. Yeah, he decides to go and explore this place he can see from his window. I, which what what was that? What was this place? Uh, Corona San Heights or something. Yeah. So he goes there, and uh, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> 
describe anything from there, but there's one scene in the book that probably makes the whole book. It's 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 very well done. Um, very you know, um, a couple of months back, I want to say uh, Ross Payton and Tom Church over at RPPR were actually uh, talking about architecture as a uh, source of uh, uh, setting of horror um, in, in gaming and how you can, uh, you know, uh, create uh, place and setting um, mm. to, you know, uh, create the... To create both maybe the tension of the problem, where the story develops from the, the setting, from the place. Certainly, the, the the most obvious iteration of that is the haunted house, um, uh, and you know goes all the way to Carcosa, I guess, mm -hmm. um, uh, or or you know um, in um, uh, what's Alan Moore's Ripper story called? From hell. From hell. From yeah, hell. where there's the, there's the whole you know, occult architecture, occult city planning, geography of London that that can be played up in that. Uh, are, you, are those sort of the song? Are those sort of the strong suits of Our Lady of Darkness? To some That's degree. Part of that, yeah. And the the one thing I wanted to just mention, I didn't think of the Ghostbusters angle, and I don't know whether that influenced that, but the movie that you think of if you're into Italian horror is that this this book got serialized in fantasy and science fiction, magazine of fantasy and science fiction in early 1977. It's like in the January and February issues. And a movie came out called Suspiria. It was a well-known horror movie made by Dario DeGento, which was a big hit in the United States, which was essentially about a girl's school which was run by an elderly witch. And that was so successful the, the Genta goes, um, it's actually part, he suddenly reveals it's part of a trilogy, and three years later he makes a movie called Inferno, in, that's 1980, and all of a sudden we've got a lot of shift of direction. This elderly witch is now one of the three mothers mentioned by Thomas de Quincy in Sighs from the Abyss. The second movie, which is Inferno, is about the Mother of Darkness, She's a mysterious woman who's always accompanying an architect who wrote a book. Yeah. I, I, I take it Fritz didn't see one dime in residuals from Mr. Argento. On this. You're right. You're right. I mean, you know, he, he will deny that he, he took it from Lyba, but, I mean, there are a lot of similarities. I'll just say that, and you make up your mind. And yeah, the, and the you, thing I, Dennis I was... Know, I can understand why Matt... Uh, we'll just pick on Matt Carpenter. I understand why he didn't like the book. There's not a lot of action in the book. I personally really liked it. I don't even know if I can articulate why. It, there's got a lot. It's got a lot of atmosphere, a lot of mood. Um, I personally do recommend it. Um, you know, pick it up. It's available for Kindle too. So, uh, it, and I I really can't say the number one reason why I recommend it, which is a scene in the book that after you read it, email me and tell me. Which scene I'm talking about? Because you'll know it's a really, really great scene. You are scene. you you really don't want to spoil that, do you? It involves you know a window. I'll take away no, 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 no! Don't say nothing. Window. No, we'll just we'll just say well, we we'll just it's the scene was the window. That's all we're gonna say. Yeah, that's all we'll say. That, yeah. Okay, that seems that seems innocuous. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I I recommend you pick it up. But don't be looking for a you know when you do if you go into it expecting a book that's atmosphere and not action, then you'll that's How about you, Pete? Much on the money, huh? I I've never been able to penetrate Liber. Oh, not even the. <laughs> I've, I've tried. Not well, even not the even... third and the Gray Mouser stuff. I've I read most of that stuff in my D and D period, and it, it just didn't hang with me. No, I mean that that moves. The, this I can understand why people didn't get into it. But you know, Fafford and the Gray Mouser is almost you know it's like reading Conan. It's a little more. You know, whimsical Careful. and intellectual. Careful. It's going to go all grognardy in a second as we complain about, about these whippersnappers with their, with their Lord of the Rings and their hobbitses. And we had Rankin Bass. We had where there's a whip, there's a way. That's what we had when we were kids. <laughs> we, yeah. What about the? Um, let me make sure I have this right. Yeah. What about uh, Pete? You never got into this one either. The uh, the dealings of Daniel Kesterich. I have I, I have that book sitting on my to be read shelf and it's I been really for ten like years. 
Ooh, that's not going to get read. Someone on the, uh, let's see, who is it? Brian Lumley. It's as if two shadows fall across the young Fritz Lieber at his desk. One might be the shade of H.G. Wells, but the other is definitely that of H.P. Lovecraft. From page one of Kesserich, I could feel the gloom settling in like a shroud. I highly recommend this one, too. This is one of my favorite yeah. books. I'll yeah. move it forward. <laughs> I'm only reading five books right now. I'm sure I can handle three more. I, I read it, but I don't remember it. Mm. Well, that could be bad, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe I, you know, wasn't a good reader then. Maybe I was looking yeah. for you know something more like the Gray Mauser, you know. Yeah. Well, I'd say Lumley has that right. It, it really is a cross between a it's you know H.G. Wells and Lovecraft, Lovecraft collaborated on it and wrote it together. Yeah. It's so. it's it, it it's more Lovecraftian than mythos. We should point out. There's no doubt. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So so anyway, uh, Delta Green. Uh, these guys are definitely worth knowing about. Please check out their Indiegogo. Um, fundraiser. Uh, you can link to it from the Lovecraft Easing website on the left side of the page, any page. You, you know, Shane, if that if that bastard Putin doesn't keep fucking around the way he's doing, I'm, I'm going to have to start rewriting the, the Russian material. You know? <laughs> I really hate it when that happens. You can always you can always count on uh, on Russia these days to give you uh, give you more <laughs> and more material to write about. Yeah, yeah that's that pretty really lovely. <laughs> Jerk. <laughs> Is that what yeah. you call guys who poison people with radioactive material? Jerk. <laughs> throw women in jail for for uh, you know saying well, for protesting against the government. And, yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, you know, um, I I uh, I gotta admit I was a little nervous way back when when I first started hearing these stories about um, how there was this weird Cossack comeback in uh, Russia where they were uh, you know having these sort of uniformed yet not part of the government groups of Cossacks turn up uh, to, you know, sort of joyously express Cossack culture. And then they started deploying them at Sochi to crack heads right. um, yeah. during the Olympics to keep people, you know, off the streets. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, and now the Crimea. Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's exciting. <laughs> yeah. It's um, exciting times in Russia today. Yeah, I, we have one Those or two. two and, we, well, never going well and we have we have a couple of Delta Green players who bought the books and so I had them sent off to Russia. You know, uh, I certainly shipped products off to them, and they were pretty happy with the Russian material we wrote. You know, um, uh, probably more happy than they are with the current events. But <laughs> you know, well, it must be Game Company weekend at Lovecraft Easing because tomorrow um, at the regular Sunday chat. Video chat, six o'clock Eastern. We're going to talk to Mike and Nick from Chaosium. So, um, got all their their stuff going on. Mike oh, Mason. Yeah. Sorry. Mike Mason. Yeah, Mike Mason. Yeah. Uh, Nick Nicario, if I'm saying his last name right. I just came home with about 150 dollars worth of their stuff from my local game store as I came into some money and uh, went directly to my local game store and bought up um, a number of their publications that I had, I had fallen behind on. Mm. Um, they have, including this, um, you know, their BRP pulp book that sort of made its way into the market without uh, making too many ripples last year. But if it's got pulp on it, I'm going to probably at least crack the cover and see whether I'm going to buy it or not. Well, we'll be talking to both of those guys, so, uh, you know, join us for that. So. Yeah, that'll be cool. It's the, 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 Mike Mason is one of the developers of the new edition of Call of Cthulhu that's coming out this year. So, um, and they're they're sort of um, done uh, shake it, shaking it up in in ways that uh, the game hasn't been shaken up <clears throat> in um, thirty years. So, uh, so well, it's been it's horror been really horror interesting horror to see how that developed. April, don't they? What's I that? Or on the Orient Express coming out in April, like the latest edition. Right, right. Yeah, they ran a big Kickstarter for that a while back, and and uh, yeah. that's so yeah, I, that's I, I uh, we're going to on the Friday night game sometime after April. We are going to play Horror on the Orient Express. Oh, which cool. I'm sure that game will last a while. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, that's the yeah, like yes, I said like yesterday. That's the dream, isn't it? Um, a mystery in the horror on a train. So yeah, yeah. 
Well, you know, it depends on what kind of train. One of the scenarios I ran at Gen Con last year was on an armored train in Siberia. And I got to tell you, that beats your Orient Express all to hell when you can. Uh, well, well, that was a horror movie, too. <laughs> horror Express with Christopher yeah. Lee. Did, yes, yeah. but, but even Christopher Lee and Tony Tully Savalas didn't have, you know, turrets with, right. you know, 76 <laughs> millimeter cannons on their train. <laughs> right. Uh, well, Scott and Shane, I want to tell you guys, thanks for being here. I also wanted to tell you guys that on the weekend shows, you guys are welcome anytime just to hang out with us. So, um, Awesome. Thank you. So thanks to, so much for having us. And, yeah, uh, letting thanks us for being here. Lather on and on and on. No, no, it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. And uh, we will see everybody tomorrow at 6 o'clock Eastern. So thanks, and, guys. Uh, oh, we should also point out, let's plug ours. Unspeakable, Mr. Uh, Ivy? <laughs> yeah. We, we, there's a, the Unspeakable Oath has a podcast. That, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's allegedly know. monthly, but we actually only ever record it about once every five years, it feels like. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, but, yeah, we're, we're, we're actually getting together tomorrow uh, afternoon to do a, a new episode. So hopefully we'll see that in the next week or two. And then uh, you know, I'll listen, immediately uh, start harassing people to, to schedule the next one so we can make a go of it. All you have to do is call, Shane, and I will, I will be there to make, make it happen. Yeah. Uh, where, where just remember that every hour you keep me online is an hour I'm not writing. Down right. <laughs> There's the danger. <laughs> Where where can people listen to that? Uh, it's uh, it's I, I, I it should still be in iTunes. Um, there's there's a direct link uh, to the feed on uh, at theunspeakableoath.com up in the top okay. menu on top of the page. You can find it pretty That's easily. Right, easy. If you search okay. iTunes. I think it'll it'll still show up even though I haven't added one in a while. Um, but we had I think the last one we did that, that I posted was a month or two ago from a Gen Con talk that. Scott and I and Ross had with uh, Ken Height and Robin Laws, which was which was lots of fun. And so they're guys, they're good they're good and talky, so they can fill some airtime. Yeah. Are you guys both going to uh, the film festival in April? I I have a game to run. I, I was one of the uh, Kickstarter you know uh, rewards where okay. um, you know uh, people would pay X amount of dollars and uh, uh, they I would run a game for them. Uh, both Peterson and I, are, and I are doing that again this year, so you can you can be in a. Uh, they're both games are sold out at this point. Um, uh, <clears throat> where uh, you can uh, you can be horribly findled, spindled, folded, and mutilated by Sandy Peterson or myself. Um, or both. Uh, or both. Pay, if you pay yeah. enough money. And I think tomorrow's tomorrow's recording for the the Oath podcast, we're going to be talking to Gwen and Brian from the film festival and sort of focusing on. Lovecraftian uh, movies, pros and cons. Which I'm actually going to be going down to Portland for a lot of mythos stuff. There's a there's a convention this month. I'm going to be play testing some material at uh, in in called um, Game Storm that's sort of in Portland. World Horror Convention is going to be in Portland uh, this May, and in April is the Fun Festival. So there will be a number of trips to Portland where there will be horrible things happening. Well, guys, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. And everybody, thanks for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow. So, see you. Good night. Thanks, guys. Night. <laughs>